Trevor, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you all here today. One of the most exciting things that we have at RBW have done, I think you know we're very excited about what we do at RBW, which is our wealth management company. But I must give tribute to my uh, son and partner, Jonathan, wherever he is. John? Where is he? Uh, it's Jonathan is uh, sneaking in there at the back. This was Jonathan's idea. I must give him credit. And the idea was born out of our mutual desire, first of all, our mutual love for Israel and respect for the Israel-America relationship, but our desire to create a vehicle that used our technology, our background, our experience, our people, our infrastructure that already works so very well uh, for RVW uh, investors and put that to work uh, in a way that would make sense so that people could invest uh, with their heads and their hearts. And up to now, um, there wasn't such a vehicle that we were aware of. So we, fill the, we think we fill the empty space between what is already available in a way that creates a legitimate way for people to invest in the thriving economy of Israel. And uh, just so you know, we, can, we certainly can and do handle investments from as small as $180 for which everyone gets a certificate that looks something like that. We have the same artistry and the same idea, so you can send someone a beautiful certificate uh, which gives them a, a, an enduring stake in the vibrant economy of Israel. And um, at the same time, it's something, as you can see from the fact sheets on your table, that does well and does good. Uh, it is now my pleasure to invite Eitan Weiss uh, to come up. He's the Acting Consulate General of Israel, and it's a particular pleasure to have you with us. Thank you so much, Eitan. Bruchim Abayim and Boker Tov. So, good morning, everyone. Uh, first, I'd like to, to thank our good friend Selwyn here for uh, initiating this great initiative, uh, the Jerusalem Portfolio. Uh, when he contacted us about this, we were kind of amazed because when you dig deep into that, you're not just investing for your own purpose. You're investing for the Jewish people. You're investing for the state of Israel. You're investing for yourself to the strong connection between both of our countries. And I think that this is a great initiative because if you know a thing or two, you know that Israel has so much to offer. Uh, just yesterday, after hard work that we had with the Arizona legislator, and governor, they have announced that they're opening a trade office in Israel. Now think about it, Arizona State opening a trade office in Israel. They're going to invest about the three to five hundred thousand dollars a year in opening that office and having it facilitate the strong connections that we have at Arizona. This office is going to join the office of Florida, Utah, and others in the making. So this is just a short example to show you that the good stuff coming out of Israel is something that just benefits Israelis, but of course uh, our patriots all across the world and our uh, colleagues and friends and family who can invest not just to build Israel, but to also build a strong connection between Israel and the U.S. I mean, I'm sure that you guys follow the news. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, an Israeli company, a medtech company, managed to print a 3D heart. A human heart, by the way. What they basically did, they took the fatty tissue of the subject. They managed to isolate the stem cells out of it. Using the stem cells, they manufactured the cells that comprise the organ itself, the heart, the blood vessels, the muscles. And they managed to print like a 3D printer and managed to print it. Now think about it for a second, that this small breakthrough will help solve in a decade the problem of people waiting in line to see or to wait for organs from donations, but more importantly, to improve the quality of life with those who undergo these surgeries by basically not using the medication dedicated to prevent the organ from being rejected. So this is one small example, but actually the real secret is, especially people in Los Angeles should be aware of that, that when you go and do a liposuction, you can also have lots of organs manufactured in the process. So <laughs> it's two birds, one stone. But I really want to thank and endorse our good friend Selwyn and his great initiative, and the Israeli consulate will be happy to help in this initiative. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Eitan. Thank you so much. Uh, my good friend David Suisa uh, is going to say a few words. Uh, he's the publisher, editor-in-chief of the Jewish Journal, so, David, your beloved friend, passionate Jew, and uh, someone who's a great lover of Israel, and it's a great honor to have you uh, just share a few words with us this morning. Thank you. Thank 
Ricky Selwyn, my brother from another mother. Uh, I had a podcast yesterday with Glenn Yego, Milken Institute, came into the office and he started speaking about one miracle after another was coming out of Israel and how Nigeria was being revolutionized because they had this plant that was created protein and they could never find a way to plant it so that they would harvest all of it. And Israel had come up with some know-how to revolutionize the injection of protein in Nigeria. And then he went through the, m of of the memorandum of operandi that they did with Governor Jerry Brown so that the Israeli know-how would help California during the days of the drought and he t took me one through one example after another of how Israel has helped America. And I tell you, I was partly embarrassed because we haven't covered it in the Jewish Journal. You will see it very soon. There are all these things. We think we know everything that's going on about Israel, but we don't. There are unbelievable things going on. Uh, and one of the other things going on is that we have shrunk and become political animals. And all we want to think about is whether you voted for Donald Trump or not. <laughs> And we have really narrowed our conversation. <clears throat> and one of the goals that we're trying to do with the Jewish Journal is expand this conversation. And that includes going beyond politics. And this Jerusalem portfolio is just a wonderful sort of demonstration of that, which is let's, let's, let's sort of open up the canvas of Israel and go beyond politics and see and invest in, uh, in, in this amazing country. It's one of the very few things in life that never fails to blow me away. Everything they touch turns to gold. You know, I, I haven't slept because I've been binge watching Stitzel, how do you pronounce it? Like, <laughs> I can't sleep. Every, every another episode, I got to click again and I'm watching these incredible Haredi, ultra orthodox, there's not a thing of skin that shows anything. And it's just, it blows me away. Everything that comes out of Israel, I don't know how they do it. I was with this cab driver once, and he was so proud of Israel, and everything I would bring up, uh, cottage cheese, we won an award in Europe, uh, croissants, we won another award in Europe. Then he's taking me through this thing, used to be a dump, now it's a tourist attraction. Um, and it's just, it, it, they got the magic, who knows how to explain it. Maybe it's the fact that necessity is the mother of invention. They've been under such stress from the very beginning. They had no natural resources. They had to focus on human resources. There's a magic sauce happening in that country. It gets covered up, unfortunately, with stuff. Uh, the, 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 the least attractive part of Israel is their politics, and it represents 90% of, of their image. And that's something that uh, is the reality. We have to live with it. But at the same time, we can have moments like this morning when we can expand the conversation and really try to look at the, the amazing things that are coming out of this country. And this morning is just an opportunity to be invested in that. So Salwin Mazaltov, this great initiative, and thanks for all the ads in the journal. <laughs> Thank you, David. Thank you so much. I wanted to announce uh, now a, a very important aspect of the Jerusalem portfolio, which is that we recently finalized, which is why I kind of missed the invitations and the PR, we recently finalized a strategic alliance with Leket Israel. I'm not going to give you a lecture on Leket that's worthy of a whole hour on its own, just to say that it's the national feeding program of Israel. Uh, they rescue food from army bases, from restaurants, from catering halls, and redistribute it in a brilliant way. The guy who runs it was a logistics uh, person for El Al. And they run it as a military operation, getting the food while it's fresh and edible to people who need it. And uh, we're very honored to, to have picked and to have been joined by such an incredible organization in Israel. If you want to feed the hungry in Israel, there's really no better way to do it than to, um, than to support Leket. The second best way is to invest in the Jerusalem portfolio because, of course, the profits we make will go there as well. Just to give you a sense of the scale this is one year in Leket. I mean, this is a non-political, non-anything, geographic. It, it's a, a fully geographic and fully population type diversification of the distribution of food to people who need it. And uh, I was actually uh, going to have our team put together a video, but I figured those statistics and what I'm telling you will be enough, and we have so much to cover that I don't want to waste any time unnecessarily. But if you have an opportunity, just go to the Leket site and watch a couple of the YouTubes. And you'll be moved to the Kishkas. Um, the, as I said earlier, the RVW technology, methodology, and basic approach is brought to the Israeli investment scene 
and to provide Israel-centric investments uh, of listed companies. So we're not in the startup space. We're not in the secure bond space. We're in the middle. We focus on finding and investing in a very diverse group of successful companies. That's the goal. That's what we set out to achieve. And the methodology will be explained to you as well as the selection process and waiting. Um, <clears throat> Our next partner, as I've already told you, is Leket Israel. We're delighted to have them as strategic partners. We have a Christian Women for Israel. You've already heard about them, and we're expecting that to be a huge exposure for us in the evangelical and Christian community. We're thrilled to have BlackRock here, and you will be... Where's Kevin? Oh, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. We're delighted. Kevin, we already have a wonderful relationship with BlackRock through RVW. We're delighted to expand that now with uh, the Jerusalem portfolio. You guys are terrific partners, and we love dealing with you. Thanks, thanks for being with us. Uh, thank you. We have Blue Star. Um, where is? Oh, you, well, you're going to be hearing. Oh, there you go. You're going to be hearing from Blue Star. Blue Star is um, a, a tremendous provider of uh, Israeli information on the economy, and you'll be having um, an, an oversight from Blue Star into the selection process and how they access the best companies in Israel. Some of the stuff that our lawyers make us say, so uh, that's all the stuff, that's all the bump that we, we're required to, to say, and hopefully you can uh, read it, absorb it, and we can uh, move on. And finally, uh, here we go. I'd very much like to introduce uh, Joe. Where's Joe? Uh, Joe is here, yeah. Joe, let me introduce Joe. Joe is uh, the, the senior person at Blue Star, the one who connects with us, and who is uh, really, as you will find out, very familiar with what's going on in Israel in terms of the actual analytical stuff we need. We have uh, our special guest for today, Stanley Gold, who will be talking about more of a macro, more of a personal experience, uh, less of a kind of in the weeds. But we wanted you to see it both in the weeds and then uh, from the perspective of a seasoned, you know, le legendary, uh, very well-known Israeli investor, Stanley Gold, who we're particularly uh, honored to have as our featured guest today. Uh, in the meantime, though, it's my great pleasure to uh, to give you Joe and uh, to learn more about uh, how the, how the uh, portfolio looks how the economy looks, and how we, uh, how we plan to participate in that. Thank you, John. Good morning. Thank you, Selwyn. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here to help uh, launch and kick off the Jerusalem portfolio. I, I come bearing regards from my partner, Stephen Schoenfeld, who was originally planning to be here. He got called away to Israel, so you get me. Um, as a SoCal native and UCLA grad, it's a, it's a, um, I appreciate the opportunity to be back in, in, in Los Angeles. It's a good excuse. My mom thinks she was well, I had to get that in. <laughs> I thought uh, a good way to start is to capture a little bit of what Stanley, uh, sorry, with uh, uh, Selwyn just mentioned. Just look for, this is how typically people invest in Israel. Does it look familiar, right? So on one hand, you have uh, Israel, Israel bonds, right? Uh, low, li low risk, low yield, uh, played an important role historically in, uh, in building the state of Israel. And on the other hand of the spectrum, you have VC venture capital. This is sexy stuff, right? High risk, high reward, um, typically low returns, only because 90% of, of startups fail. So you better have a Stanley Gold or an RVW on your side to do it right. Um, but this is sexy. But when you look at this ecosystem as a simple introduction, Blue Star, we focus on everything in the middle. Right, or public equities, or how most people typically invest their assets for the long term. Uh, at Blue Star, we build a family of indexes or benchmarks that define aspects of the Israeli capital market. And what makes us unique is how we capture Israeli companies regardless of where they've gone public in the world. This is important because a third of the free-floating market cap of Israel is actually listed outside the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange. And uh, we'll focus more on that later. Our Israel indexes uh, are are the basis for two U.S. listed ETFs uh, that are proudly part of the Jerusalem portfolio. And these same strategies are available in Israel for the domestic market. And at Blue Star, we're, we're disrupting the way that Israelis invest in their own economy. Uh, at Blue Star, we believe that if Israel is in your heart or Israel is in your philanthropic mission, then Israel should be in your portfolio, right? And when Israel's in your portfolio, it's potentially a triple bottom line. First and foremost, it's a good investment, proven to be alpha generating over time. Second, as the Council General said, it's good for Israel, right? Investing in Israeli companies strengthens Israel's economy 
and its robust tech ecosystem by increasing liquidity and deepening the capital markets. Um, this issue of ensuring companies can access the capital markets to grow and not just turn to the banks or, or to sell out early is so critical to the Israeli government, they've recently uh, convened a number of working groups to address it. So I, I like to say that investing in Israeli equities is no less than a critical national development goal. And third, and this is something you've heard also, that, um, that it's a proactive, positive uh, step towards uh, look, you know, against the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, right? Because in this case, investment is the direct antidote to divestment. And what better way to fight an economic battle than with an economic arrow? But for the moment, I want you to take the feel good and put it aside. Because so often, Israel is, is captured in the philanthropic mindset or the philanthropic bucket, right? So put that aside. And I want to make the pure investment case for Israel, because I think it is even more particularly more compelling. If you only remember three things today, this is what I think. Israel uh, has emerging market-like growth with a developed body, with developed market stability and standards. Israel is the second, Israel is, the, is one of the best performing developed markets, and the story is just beginning. And I'm going to show you that. It's well positioned for future growth. And three, Israel is leading the world in innovation, the future of technology. This is no surprise to anyone. And you're most likely missing it from your portfolio. So let's dive into the numbers. What you're looking at here is Israel's GDP growth in blue versus o the OECD average. Think of the OECD as a proxy for the developed markets. A couple of things to note. Israel's GDP has outperformed OECD average every year since 2004. It was one of only four countries to have positive GDP growth in the 08-09 global financial crisis. And it's been a consistent grower. It's a leader. It's ranked in the top three eight of the last 10 years. In 2019, this year, Israel is expected to be one of the fastest growing developed markets expanding 1.3% in the first quarter alone. Now, underlying all of this, uh, this favorable, uh, these economics are favorable growth and demographics. 43% of Israelis are under 25 years old. I'm just gonna pause for a second, say that again. 43% of Israelis are under 25 years old. Israel's population is growing over 2.2%. Immigration is net positive. Right, especially from uh, from developed countries with a uh, with skilled workforce, and I want you to look at these charts here on the right. The top shows the percent of the population that, that is under 14 years old. Think of this as the proxy for about to enter the workforce. Notice how significantly higher the blue line is than the developed markets in black, and this trend's been pretty steady for a while. Now, combine that with the over 65 chart on the bottom, which show, and you can see how young Israel's population truly is, and begins to create an interesting picture, right? This is unbelievable for a developed market. Think again, emerging market-like growth in a developed body. And these charts are gonna look even more dramatic in the years to come. Combine this with the fact that Israel, the Israel economy is also enjoying near low unemployment, it's now at 3.9%, just off, its, it's off the low of last year of 3.6. Um, more people are joining the workforce. We heard a comment about Haredi. Yes, Haredi men and Arab Israeli women, especially. And real wages, and this is like it, um, income adjusted for inflation, is rising, along with household consumption. Israel's fiscal management has been stellar. It has an impressive 61% debt to GDP ratio. Does anyone know what the US debt to GDP is in the room? 105, 106, right? Japan's like 250, right? Crazy. Interest rates did not go negative like other developed markets. And Israeli banks have very strict capital requirements. In fact, they're the first to meet Basel III um, when introduced in 2011. And because of all this, Israel received an upgrade to their government bonds last year to, from A to A plus, making every Jewish mother proud, right? <laughs> And just recently to A, double A minus, putting them higher than the likes of China, Japan, Taiwan, and similar companies as, as Taiwan. 
these, these rating increases are, are really important to Israel. Um, according to Finance Minister Moshe, uh, Moshe Cologne, and this is a quote, Israel's upgraded credit rating will save us billions of shekels and, in, in expenses, and these will be directed to the health, education, and welfare ministries. So, so speaking of the shekel, Israel's a very stable cu currency, right? Um, as you can see by the trend lines, this is actually a 12-year chart showing the, the conversion from new Israeli shekels to the U.S. dollar. And you can see recently on the right um, that the shekel did rise a bit against the dollar in 2016 and 17, although it was a bit weaker in 18. And this is more, has less to do about the rise, any issue in Israel, more about um, the, uh, the, the reaction to U.S. monetary policy and rising rates in the U.S. But you can see how, how tight anyone who's been to Israel knows how consistent the currency exchange has been against the dollar. Um, and so this is actually, uh, uh, it's it created a place where um, the shekel has been one of the world's largest, strongest currencies, and that's great. So these are all indications of a strong, strong investment. And, and this is before, this is before we add in the Leviathan gas, uh, natural gas fields. As recently as the beginning of this past decade, uh, energy imports were a significant deadweight uh, cost to the economy. By the time we end this decade, it will be positive, right? They'll go from a net importer of energy to a net exporter of energy. And if it's not good enough, Dainu, they're going to create the first sovereign wealth fund to shield this tax windfall from the politicians. So as we shift gears, we can't talk about Israel, right, without focusing on the mass amount of innovation coming out of the country. You've probably seen some version of this chart before in various formats. You know, according to the World Economic Forum and the OECD, Israel is a second in innovation, has the most engineers per capita, ranked third in the world of, uh, of quality of scientific research, and the first in R&D spending. And the list goes on. This is just a, a, a little snapshot. This is, of course, impressive for a, a country the size of New Jersey. This focus on innovation is not, is not by happenstance. It's truly in Israel's DNA, right? Israel is a classic island nation economy. Let's be honest, Israel doesn't trade much with its immediate neighbors, right? And so it has been globally focused, innovating to solve the immediate, press, immediate pressing issues of limited natural resources, right, in a hostile environment since day one. So to illustrate this, um, I mentioned on the last slide that um, Israel has the highest ratio of R&D spending to GDP in the developed world at 4.5%. Now what's interesting about this is that 65% of that is performed by foreign companies operating within Israel. This also is not by accident. It rather purposely designed by Israel's founders and later codified in the 1984 R&D laws, which provides grants, loans, tax incentives for foreign entities that set, up, um, that set up operations with export capacities. This has really helped create an environment within, is in it within Israel focused on innovation and set the stage for the boom in Israel's tech sector and the startup nation that we know today. The way to think about it is that foreign investment has led to export expansion in dark blue, which has significantly accelerated GDP per capita in green which is an indicator of economic performance and useful in comparing the average standard of living or economic well-being. That's the extent of the economic lesson for this morning, so don't worry. Reading the list of companies that have significant R&D centers in Israel is a virtual who's who, right? ABC of who's who, Google, IBM, S&P, GE, just to name a few. And it's not just the publicly traded companies. You heard from the Council General that universities and foreign governments want a piece, they want a partnership of Israel. And on the right, what you can see is there's what's created are these, these various technology hubs with, with Israeli companies playing a leading role. So you can see that in Tel Aviv is more software focused with companies like Amdocs, the old Israeli phone book, uh, that's reinvent reinventing itself as a key player in 5G rollout. But there's also uh, Wix and Saragon Network. In the north of Israel, it's becoming a hub of agritech and water technology. 
Solar Edge making uh, solar panels. Arad is a fabulous water metering, com metering company doing great stuff. And my favorite, Ormat, which is uh, harnessing the power of the earth focused on geothermal power. And down south, of course, in Beersheba, it's all about cybersecurity, right? With its close proximity to the corresponding military bases. The Negev Desert is, can be completely transformed into a global cybersecurity hub. And, of course, Jerusalem, Intel, through their acquisition of the autonomous driving pioneer Mobileye in 2017 for $15.3 billion, is working to turn Jerusalem into an Internet of Things hub with autonomous driving, machine learning, and artificial intelligence at its core. So again, this is sort of the snapshot of, of it, the case for Israel in a, in a nutshell. Like strong fundamentals driven by demographics and smart fiscal policy and cutting edge technology. Just, just look at the bottom, the themes on the bottom for a moment. Think for a moment. What do you think the world will look like in three, five, ten years from now? How many of you think cybersecurity is going to be more or less important in our lives? Right? Or big data, artificial intelligence. How about the Internet of Things, which is like a sensor in a garage can that tells the trash collector that it's full? Um, how about the combination of biotech and medical devices? We hear about that all the time. These are clean, I mean, clean tech, water, the list goes on. These are the themes that you want in your portfolio, and these are the themes in which Israel is truly excelling. So it's about this time in the presentation, people start thinking about, yeah, I wonder how much I or my clients you know, have in uh, Israel exposure in their portfolio. Um, and the answer is, is actually a lot less than you think. So let me explain and make the case. Prior to 2010, Israel was approximately 3.8% of the emerging markets. So it's a big fish in a small pond and was heavily covered by analysts and active managers. Following the graduation to the developed markets in 2010, which is a recognition of how established and globally integrated Israel has become, Israel became a very small sliver of the developed markets. We call it a pimple on the tuchus, right? It didn't exist. Today, what you see here is, today's, is Israel's weight in IFA, which is the developed markets. It represents about a half a percent. But back in 2010, it was a one-third of 1%. One At such a small amount, active managers, well, they, sim they simply just ignored Israel. Maybe they included Teva, which is a huge part of the market at the time, maybe Checkpoint. But for the most part, we all lost exposure to Israel in our portfolios. And at Blue Star, we've looked at hundreds of individual fa and, and foundation portfolios, those that have a connection to Israel and those that don't from a mission standpoint. And our research shows, unless you make an active decision to include Israel in your portfolio, you most likely are missing all of this. Another issue with, having, um, in with investing in Israeli companies as I mentioned to it before, that a third of the free-floating market cap is actually found outside of Tel Aviv, um, mostly in New York, right? It makes sense. But also in London and Singapore and Australia. You know, there, there are 18 Israeli public companies in Australia. Only two are large enough and liquid enough to make it into our investable index. So at Blue Star, we created a new framework, a set of quantitative and qualitative criteria to identify and recapture Israeli companies regardless of where they were. Um, I'm not going to bore you with the details. The methodology is here on the screen. Essentially, you need one from the top and or two from the bottom. And this is what effectively allowed us to recapture and, and be able to capture uh, the Israeli investment opportunity. So with this broader, more complete definition of Israel, let's play a little game, shall we? Maybe, just maybe, using this definition, we have a little bit more Israel in our portfolios than we think. All right, so let's look at a few more popular indexes. To, uh, to, to, to check it out. So the first is, how many Israeli companies do you think are in the S&P 500? This is easy. I hear zero? All right, zero. This is a very well-informed group. All right, what about you know, Israel Tech? What about the NASDAQ 100? How many Israeli companies are, on, are, are on the, in the NASDAQ 100? I hear two. Higher, lower? Ten, I hear 10, one, one. Checkpoint. Right, it's, point, it's like 0.22%. 
Um, okay, but the NASDAQ 100 really isn't a true tech index, so let's go with the uh, Dow Jones t uh, Technology Select Index. This is sort of the proxy for the U.S. tech market. How many Israeli companies are in the Dow Jones Select? Five? That's a good guess. Zero. Zero. <laughs> okay, last one. What about the S&P Global 1200? This, is, this index covers over 31 countries, approximately 70% of the world's, of the global stock market capitalization. How many Israeli companies are listed in the global, S&P Global 1200? Zero. Israel is not in the construction of the S&P 1200, therefore Israel is not, Israeli companies are not in the index. So the bottom line is if you don't take an active decision or make the active decision to include these companies, you're essentially missing it all. And finally, and finally, the question that's usually on everyone's mind, how have Israeli stocks performed? Right, show me the money. What we're showing here is rel the relative performance over the past 10 years. Israel represented in blue, Israel tech in green, developed markets in black, and emerging markets, we throw it in gray. And you can see how much Israel's outperformed since the 2008 crash. Sure, the numbers look great year to date, right, clearly. But take a look at the two gray columns, right? Israel on the left, developed markets on the right. Look at the three and five year annualized returns. Uh, about 4% outperformance. That's, that's substantial for anyone who knows how money compounds. Um, and it's significant. And I'll end with a cherry on top. Israeli tech stocks in green, which have enjoyed a tremendous outperformance versus their peers, um, are, are currently significantly less expensive on a forward looking price to earnings ratio than other developed technology companies. It's like 12 to versus 18, which is pretty significant. So in conclusion, I want to end where I started from and thank you for allowing me to spend some time with you today. And a big mazel tov to the Jerusalem portfolio and the team at RVW for bringing this opportunity to life. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. That was a terrific uh, presentation. It's now my great honor, it's actually our great honor, all of us at uh, Team uh, TJP, to welcome Stanley Gold. Um, I just want you to know that I've first uh, met Stanley a long time ago, when he was a lawyer at Gang, Raymer, Tyre, and Brown, and I was a partner at Breslauer. He probably doesn't remember me, I was a pisher in those days, but he was almost a pisher himself. Uh, and over that time, I followed his, uh, his incredible uh, success. Uh, but more important than his business success is his incredible love for Israel, his community leadership, uh, and the role model he's been for all of us who care about Israel, the United States, and the local Jewish community. Uh, he truly is an icon, uh, and it's a great pleasure to, uh, to introduce him to you and to have uh, our own Jeff Abrams, who's known him uh, better than I have, uh, to, uh, to ask him a few questions, go through a few uh, issues, and maybe have him share some of his experience, wisdom, and insight with us today. So I ask you to give a warm welcome to Stanley Gold. So Stanley, thank, thank you for joining us today. Um, I've been privileged to know you for many years and uh, as a met one of my mentors, uh, both communally and professionally. So thank you very much for being with us. Uh, I won't go into the depth of your background, it's in the materials available, but most uh, importantly for our conversation today has been your experience and leadership at Shamrock. Over the last several decades with your partner Roy Disney, deploying over $2 billion in different investments, including through the, Isra the Shamrock Israel Growth Fund. So I'd like to take you back to when you first got involved in Israel, uh, back to 1989, we heard from Joe today about some of the attributes currently above the Israeli economy, but I want to go back in time of what initially drew you to Israel as an investor and how things maybe have shifted about some of those critical factors that still draw you to Israel. Uh, one, thank you for having me today. Um, I, I appreciate it. Um, two, you don't need to hear from me after Joe's presentation. You all ought to be uh, uh, Israeli investors. That was very impressive. Um, 
So when I first um, became acquainted in the uh, early 80s with, uh, uh, with Israel and its economy, um, I sort of, uh, like all of us, put a sheet and said, what are the positives, what are the negatives? And in the end, for me, the positives were the following. You could buy brains wholesale. You could convert it to a product, sell that product on the world market at retail. That made a lot of sense to me. The, the, the domestic market, the home market, is too small to have a major product. But if the product will sell on the world, it can be made faster, cheaper, and better in Israel uh, than most places in the world. And so uh, that was very attractive. The second thing, it doesn't get a lot of attention, but it is when you, when you begin to invest in foreign countries more and more emerging, is that Israel has a very sophisticated common law system. Uh, it is uh, it's, uh, the remains of the British mandate, but it is common law, so any lawyer or accountant or businessman in America will be very familiar with uh, uh, the concepts. And uh, as a result, there is very little um, uh, bribery or corruption in, in terms of world markets. So when you start getting into places like Asia or Africa, it, it, it is a constant problem in terms of investing. So Israel could, could make these products better um, and cheaper, faster, uh, and you had a pretty good sense that when you invested something, it wouldn't disappear. You've all heard stories about China, which is a wonderful juggernaut, but you invest 50% in a company, struggle for five years, and as soon as it uh, uh, becomes successful, your Chinese partner says to you, uh, you better sell me your half, or, 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 or we're not going there. You don't find that in Israel. So th those were the, the, the kinds of things that made it uh, very attractive for me. And, and what about today, since you're still involved in the Israeli market, what continues to draw you today to the Israeli market? Well, uh, the, the big difference is uh, when I discovered uh, Israel in the 80s, quickly other people discovered it. And so the great bargains, because they were lacking capital, has somewhat disappeared. The more capital you get into uh, the private equity market, the more efficient it becomes. And so there, in many respects, the changes today are, uh, uh, it would probably be better to invest in public securities than the private equity. Private equity has, there's still some, we still own some, but we've even moved some of our investing into the public securities market uh, because the efficiency of the private equity market has shrunk. Uh, the bargains are gone, and so you have to look more of a public company analysis. Uh, we still like it. Um, there are, uh, you heard some of the things from Joe. There's, there's one, I, 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 I'm, uh, it, it's still bench science, not a company. You can't invest in it. Um, and you know when you go into a, a medical office or a clinic, the first thing is they draw blood because they run it through a spectrum, and they can begin to find out what ails you. Well, all the chemicals in your blood are also um, uh, in the air you exhale. And, and there is a, it's actually very interesting, he's an Israeli Arab, he's uh, at one of the major universities, uh, what they call a smart nose. And, it, and you just put it on, breathe it, attach it to a small little uh, thing, and all of a sudden you get readouts. For people on the battlefield, for people in Africa and emerging nations, this is going to be a device that revolutionizes uh, the medical profession. And where is it being developed? Uh, quietly in Israel. I'm sure that uh, somebody will give it some seed capital and it'll be a big company someday. And today's uh, startup becomes tomorrow's public company. Exactly. Uh, I, want, I want to draw you back uh, to 2001 at the Israel Business Conference. And you spoke at a session that was devoted to the business climate globally after 9-11. I can't remember what I had for breakfast and you're taking me back which is, that which, which is why I actually have a quote. So at that time, you said that these kind of attacks that were going on, 9-11 including at, in Israel as well at the time, were political and security events and not economic factors that have to be taken into account in Israeli investment decisions. What's your current view of the situation? The same. Look, at uh, Israel is, since 9-11 has been under attack. 
uh, hasn't figured out a way to uh, achieve peace with its neighbors. Its political system is in turmoil. Uh, whether they go to elections or again, uh, we'll know, I guess, by midnight Israeli time. Uh, so through all of this uh, political chaos, you saw the charts. The economy continues to grow. Uh, if you're an investor, um, the, the proof in the pudding is that through all of security attacks, miserable political uh, shenanigans, the economy continues to grow. Uh, conditions are better, economic conditions for Israelis continue to improve year after year. Their companies have results. There was one chart that Joe showed, uh, 209. 209 is a reflection of the, uh, I guess we call it the Great Recession these days. Um, it, it was a negative uh, worldwide. It was positive in Israel. Why? Because, uh, not because um, Israel um, uh, had better economics. They had better bank controls. The, where every major city bank had loads of this uh, security debt, this uh, home mortgage debt that got securitized and all went bust. Uh, I think in the whole country, Israel had, maybe they owned a billion dollars, which is a small amount in terms of worldwide. Their controller of the banks would not allow uh, their banks to uh, invest in speculative investments, required sound capitalization, and uh, it, it, it was just uh, outstanding. It's a, it's a place that has control of its economy, uh, continues to grow it, and every once in a while you throw in a ringer of a venture capital that hits the moon. Uh, you know all the names probably better than I do. Um, I, I, I can't imagine why one would not invest in Israel. So what, let's uh, probe that a little bit more in the uniqueness about Israel. So one of Shamrock, Israel's more recent uh, investments was in Ahava, the world-renowned cosmetics company. Now, Ahava has a plant located along the Dead Sea and lies within the West Bank. So, as at, time, at times, has been the target of BDS activists. So, again, as an investor in that unique environment, how, how do you factor that in, this unique aspect of the Israeli economy? Got to have a bit of a, uh, a hard shell. Uh, when I was um, uh, the owner of uh, Ahava, we have sold it, uh, and I'll tell you a bit of the story about selling it. Uh, it, its plant, main plant, was outside the Green Line, or as you say, the West Bank. Um, I got visited uh, in both of my jobs by the pink ladies who had protests. I went downstairs and invited them up uh, to have coffee and discuss their stuff. I said, you realize that if we close the plant, as you're telling me, and they said, they had some outrageous claims that we were stealing the natural resources of the Palestinians, i.e. salt out of the Dead Sea. If anybody's ever been to the Dead Sea, there's enough <laughs> sodium in the Dead Sea forever. Uh, so it was, I said, you, you don't know what you're talking about. But, but more importantly, so let me, let me assume, I, I just agree with what you want. You will cost about 20 Palestinian jobs. Who do you think works in this plant, making the bottles and putting the labels on and filling them? And so you're, what you're really asking is to hurt the, the, the Palestinian economy as much as you're going to hurt the Israeli economy. They left. We continued. Uh, it, it wasn't a big bull. You, you've got to have a little bit of a hard skin. Um, Israelis like to uh, holler once in a while. Uh, I know how to holler back. And you, uh, you move on. It's, it's a Jewish trait. Uh, uh, the interesting thing is when we sold it, we sold it to the Chinese, and the Chinese right now are all over Israel as investors. They're looking to buy companies. They, too, have figured out what the chart that Joe showed, uh, what, what many of you in this room know about um, uh, innovation, uh, technology, and so they are looking at uh, all kinds of companies. The Israeli government is a little bit worried about uh, uh, cybersecurity and military stuff. So they, they've not been able to buy everything they want, but they were able to buy a cosmetic company, uh, Ahava. Um, and, um, and, it, and it tells you a little bit about where the world, where others in the world think Israel uh, is going to be. They're going to take, and they are taking, and have increased production and sales. They, they bought this company to take it, to the, take the product to China. The, the, the company will remain in Israel, but, 
the Chinese, as, as many of you know, has a middle class in absolute numbers bigger than the United States, probably 200, 250 million. These women want nice dresses, handbags, cosmetics, everything the American middle class wants. And they see Israeli products as being uh, high quality, like the French products, like good perfumes. And the Israeli name in China is Oh boy, those boy, people are smart. They make good products. And they will uh, ramp up the production of Hahava. China will be its biggest market within two, three years. Fascinating. Thank you. So in, in the interest of time, just a, a couple more questions. So you've been investing now over 40 years in Israel. And you've shared a little bit about the more people have gone smarter uh, about the opportunity. But in that experience, looking back in time, really what has changed in the, in the investment opportunities? Well, the, the, is, one of the things, when I first invested, there was a question about whether Israeli managers were at a world-class standard. Um, and that was always a bit of a doubt in my mind. A as time has gone, the managers in Israel are world-class. Uh, half of them go to MBA schools here, Columbia, uh, UCLA, you name it. The, the, the quality of the executive uh, in Israel is every bit as good as it is in Europe or, or, or America. Um, so that's changed for the better. Um, the, the country has matured, um, and, and people understand um, that the, the products are, are, are quality, and so they get incorporated into um, uh, other people's products. Israel is still a business-to-business -business sort of kind of business. They're on, on the retail side, Ahava being an, an exception, most of their products go into other products. Uh, Waze gets bought by uh, Google. Uh, um, um, uh, Magic Eye or whatever, it's going to get incorporated into uh, car systems. Um, and, and so uh, people uh, in the world uh, have finally acknowledged that the quality of the products coming out of Israel is, uh, is as good as uh, or better than everywhere else. And then finally, on, on a personal level, from when you first started investing in Israel, and I think you shared a story with me about that first call you received about the opportunity to invest in Israel. From then until now, what has that meant to you on a personal basis in terms of your connection to Israel? Um, I think uh, David said it, uh, the uh, acting council general said it. Uh, you, um, uh, you get a good feeling. One, you make yourself some money, you make your clients money, uh, you think you're uh, doing a good for the uh, Jewish people, the state of Israel. Uh, it, it makes you feel uh, that you've, uh, you, you've cr checked a lot of boxes uh, and are proud of your behavior um, uh, in, in an ethical way and, and helping people who deserve uh, a hand up. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank me. Thank Stanley Gold. Thank you, thank you. That's uh, terrific. Thank you, Stanley. Thank you, and thank you, Jeff. Okay, uh, as we wrap up, just a couple of things I wanted to uh, point out to you. First of all, when you go to our website, you're going to see these things. You're going to see that you can own or give a stake in the dynamic economy of Israel. So we also own the name stake in Israel, my stake in Israel, and several others, because that's really the goal, is to own an enduring stake. And as you see and as you will learn from the selection process, it's kind of a Darwinian model that overweights winners and underweights losers and so on. So it keeps changing over time. And you can treat it kind of as an evergreen portfolio because the adjustments that need to be made are made by us and by the funds you invest in in a real-time active manner as a kind of robo-advisor, which is how we've kept the cost low and hopefully optimized returns over time. So um, it's a great way to give a gift. And if there are a few things I can uh, tell you, and of course, you know, where yesterday meets tomorrow, that's really where Israel stands. Um, the land of the Bible and the startup nation. I invest for yourself or make a gift to commemorate a special occasion. Um, and so we make Israel-focused investing accessible, affordable, easy. You can do it online. If you have significant portfolios, our team at RVW is dedicated to working with you so that we can customize to the extent necessary uh, to do that. And as you leave, I would just ask you to do a few things. First of all, pick up the materials on your table. There are two handouts. I think they speak volumes about the actual data. 
There's a book that my son and I wrote called The Wealth Blueprint. Please take a copy with our compliments. And finally, we do have for um, a, a broader audience than this an open house at our office this afternoon from 4.30 to 6.30. If you want to make sure that you do your piece towards helping this uh, endeavor, which I hope you all will do, is make sure everybody knows about it. Thank you so much for being part of this launch. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Take one of these on the way out. Take some of these on the way out. And uh, have a terrific day. Thank you. This podcast is not intended to constitute investment, legal, or tax advice. The ideas and strategies expressed in this podcast are not necessarily those recommended or implemented by RBW Wealth. Please consult and rely exclusively on your professional advisors.